Oh, they're back. Oh, there we go. There I am. Welcome back, everyone. I hope you enjoyed your lunch and the chance to um, have a conversation. I am so pleased. This is, as you know, I've been at NGO for really quite a long time now. And this is the first time, I'm slightly ashamed to say, we've actually had a panel of young people. So it's actually... Yeah. <laughs> so it's um, yeah, very, um, very exciting um, to have you all with us. And you've travelled to, to be with us as well. So that's particularly, um, particularly appreciated. Um, so I've got um, a number of um, uh, questions that I'm going to be putting to the panel and we'll, we'll see where we, we, we get to and whether there's a, a chance to extend, uh, extend the conversation as well. So I'm going to um, ask each of the panel to introduce themselves um, and then to start at that point, at that same point, to say why is this topic? of climate change um, important to you and how did you get involved? So I think um, we said we would start with Honey. You do introduce yourself. Um, hi, I'm Honey Bradshaw from St. Christopher's Sixth Form and I'm the eco-captain of our Sixth Form and I've been involved with your group for all seven years of my um, academic life. So what got you, what got you involved in this topic? I think initially it was it was a friend of mine who had an older friend who was involved with the eco group, but then um, she left and I stayed because I thought it was um, it was a necessary topic for our environment as 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 you clearly believe if you're governors of children I would hope that you believe that children are our future they will go on to. Um, to, to push the agenda in our environment, in the future, in academia in general. And so if children get educated, then they will know what to do in the future and how to keep, you know, the planet alive and then and work with the, with the few resources that we will have as, the, as that we do now. Thank you. Um, and Isaac, do you want to come in too? Hi, I'm Isaac Nawab and I'm from St. Christopher's. I'm currently the senior eco rep in our main school. I believe sustainability is important um, in order to keep our environment the same for future generations um, so that we can preserve mat precious materials to live an easier life in the future for our generation and for others to come. Thank you. Um, and then Eliza, you're, you're from a different school, I a am. different part of the country. Yes. Tell, tell us who you are and how you came to be involved. Hi, I'm Eliza Kinder. I'm a year 11 at the Petersfield School. Uh, I'm from Hampshire. So I got involved just as a, an eco-prefect at my school, and then I joined the Hampshire UK SSN, and then I became the Hampshire rep for um, UK Sustainable Schools Network. Um, I think sustainability is a topic that, as a young person, it's difficult not to be passionate about because this is the planet for us, like this is um, for future generations. Um, and I've just been starting small, you know, uh, helping out my school and now here. Yeah, so, so from your school to Hampshire to, mm -hmm. to here, yeah, exactly. we'll, come, we'll come back and learn, and learn a bit more about what you've been doing mm -hmm. in, your, um, in your network, because there will be networks mm -hmm. all, all across the country, and, and also St Christopher's is very, very involved in, in the North West, so we'll absolutely come, come back to that. Um, so Jody uh, from Mock Cop, tell us again how you got all involved in this and also what Mock Cop is. Yeah, so I'm Jody. I'm currently a first year uh, university student at the University of Manchester. Um, Mock Cop is um, a student led youth organization um, globally. So we platform young people's voices and we also are dedicated to supporting youth campaigners across the world um, into lobbying and getting climate policy um, through their like respective political systems. So we've supported people in um, Africa, in Asia, Southeast Asia, Indonesia, um, to go ahead and speak to their representatives um, about climate policy and um, a lot of the work that we're doing now is around climate education um, and climate education is a field that I've been working in for about three years so obviously that's why that's why I'm here. 
So, in fact, in about two minutes, we've gone from school to county to national to global. <laughs> so, well, that's very, very impressive. So, um, three... Oh, now I'm going to get... It. And I practiced this before as well, didn't I? Um, you introduce yourself, and I'll get it right <laughs> I'm Thizari. Um, I'm a first-year student at the University of Nottingham, and I'm with Teach the Future. I first got into climate activism through a detention... I was not a well-behaved kid. My t English teacher was like, you either go to this detention or you go to eco club. And I chose eco club. <laughs> <laughs> and I really enjoyed it. I always kind of cared about the environment and I learned more and more. And I learned about how uh, climate change affects my community in Algeria, especially. Um, like uh, how the economy will change about how agriculture will change, and it's you know, really important to me. And Teach the Future is a campaign trying to get climate education throughout the entire curriculum. It's like preparing kids for the green economy in the future because we have to have one. Absolutely, so you've been involved both at school and university as well, so yeah. we make, make sure we, we cover um, both of those. So um, let's go back to uh, St. Christopher's and talk about how pupils at your school um, have raised the issue of climate change, um, what the sort of things that you've been saying and doing. And this is, keep going because this is quite a long question, so you probably <laughs> have quite a lot to say because I know at St. Christopher's you've done a lot because I also think it'd be really helpful to know. What are the things that worked well? What you know, some some tips would be brilliant. So you're a bit of a double act. Do you want to start first, honey? Mm -hmm. Well, um, as as you mentioned, the Teach the Future project. I've um, participated in that last year with um, a student who is now in the first year of university. So we talked about your know, climate change during a um, staff meeting at the beginning of school. And while I cannot tell you how much went in, I, uh, um, I, I do believe that I think it at least made an impact as there were students who were willing to take um, time out of their schedule to, te um, to speak in front of teachers who can be quite intimidating to them and work towards making a difference. St. Christopher's also starts the, um, the Northwest Eco Conference, which is the largest children's conference in the UK, and is, and is a ready to go like, region-wide if, if the support is there and the backing is there. And then we teach mostly primary school children about the varying aspects of sustainability, so from food to like transport to, f to animals to a wide range of things to like plastic, um, anything like that and also um, a guest appearance from the Trash and Show where um, students who take textiles in our school make you know like dresses, skirts, anything out of like crisp you know like um, trash, um, crisp packets, anything like that and I'm in part I'm doing this conference since I was in year seven with a couple of years out for COVID. As I'm in year 13, I am almost free of it. But uh, um, I think it's been a great experience and especially getting to interact with these primary school children to perhaps like plant a seed of like, of this attitude, active attitude towards sustainability. They can like bring that on to their schools, to their primary, to their primary schools, then in high school and make their own you know, make the wrong mark, possibly. Thank you, there's so much there to delve into. So Isaac, do you want to add some more detail of some of the things that you've been doing? And I've just picked out, but you might have chosen other things. It'd be good to know a little bit more about food and have you managed to change food in the school and how did that go down? Um, transport, you just talked about, be interesting for, for, for people to hear about that and particularly because about half the people in this room maybe slightly more do govern at primary schools so if you want to say a bit more about your primary school work I'm sure that would be really useful but Isaac you might have chosen other things to say in which case you can just ignore those suggestions. <laughs> <laughs> um, in our school we have um, changed our food that we eat at school um, ever since I've been there really. Um, we try to reduce plastics and single-use materials for our food. 
So we're no longer using any plastics in any of the um, materials of like bottles of water and drinks, etc. cetera. Um, we also are, um, we also fund like the food from our own polytunnels, which we grow like fruit and vegetables. And um, in our food tech classes, unused food is used for a sleep out that we do, um, which is which we make soup and give it to um, a charity. Thank you, um, Eliza. What about you? Tell tell us about what you've been what you've been doing at your school. Uh, so at our school, we have an eco club, um, mostly the younger years, but some older year too, um, and. All the efforts within our school have been student orientated so the teachers just sort of follow along with what the students say. Um, one of the most recent things we've done is uh, campaigning and fundraising for the solar panels to be put in the school. So we as a students have raised £50,000 for solar panels which will be put in uh, shortly. Um, as well as this uh, we've been involved with uh, creating habitats and pollination um, yeah, and tree planting as well. Thank you. Maybe we'll come back to, I don't want you to have to say anything you wouldn't want to say in public, but that's really interesting, that point about student leadership, which mm -hmm. we've absolutely come across, that you are often like a step ahead of the, the grown-ups in the, in the room, so maybe, maybe we might want to come back to that, about yeah, how yeah. you can, and I know obviously Teach the Future in particular is really aimed at that, but but how some of the information that you've got mm -hmm. and the, the passion that you've got can be, um, can be, can be utilised. Um, so, Jodie, you next. Um, so what have we done in school? I can kind of speak to this on two levels because um, as someone, as, individu as an individual, sorry, um, obviously we have things like the S Sustainability Council, we've been talking to teachers, um, basically, everything that's already been said on the panel kind of has been reciprocated in my school. Um, but something that we've also um, been working on through Mock Cop is this project called Teach the Teacher. And we also have kind of spin-off called Teach the Governor. Um, and it's basically a project which aims to empower students enough that they feel confident in going into their own classrooms and giving their teachers a workshop on climate change um, and the other things they're worried about including like climate justice and climate anxiety as well as then how to weave climate education into the classroom because that's you know that's really really important and that's the kind of things that teach the future mock cop that's the end goal but it can often feel really overwhelming for teachers to know where to even kind of begin so the aim of the workshop is to increase confidence in teachers but also to empower students to feel like they can have that audience and that the teachers are listening to them so we've obviously we've done we've done that in my school I think a couple of students here have done it in their school um, and that's something that we're also rolling out globally um, we also brought that to COP26 last year which was which was amazing yeah it was really really impressive for those of you that didn't watch any of COP last year it was very impressive the young people's um, input into into the conference and how yeah. articulate um, and persuasive persuasive people were. So yeah, it's a great, great thing um, that you've done. Um, and what about you? Um, yeah, again, kind of the same lines of like sustainability, raising money. Um, we also had a manifesto to reduce our emissions as a school, but also we did a lot of work with the University of Worcester, um, which they launched like a multi-university study into teacher training um, about how to educate teachers to teach about the environment better. And we were involved in speaking to both the students and the educators on ways in which we believe are good ways of introducing sustainability into school and just helps nationwide and bring it along. and. Um, it got published in like a big book, which was kind of cool. <laughs> um, but uh, as a, you know, in the school, we declared a climate emergency as well. I think we were the first in the country to do so, um, which was kind of fun persuading our head teacher and our school governors to do that. We were like, this would be a good idea because the county didn't do it, so we'll do it as a school. 
So that's really interesting. So did, was there any action that happened as a result of you saying there was a climate emergency? Um, what did you have in your manifesto? So that, was that a pupil-led manifesto? Um, yeah, we, like wrote, we were like, well, we're not going to do some empty thing and just declare it. We will enact on it. And so there were... Part of the manifesto was like questions to ask both students and teachers on ways you can be more sustainable in your life, but also um, it led to us raising money for our solar panels. Like we do, don't sell single-use plastic in our school anymore. Um, we, God, this is, <laughs> we we only had one water refill station for a school of fifteen hundred students, so no one used that, and so we added like three more. Um, but that's what I can remember. <laughs> thank, you, thank you. Now I'm a bit worried that the answer to this question, the next question is going to be really short, but it's a really important one for this for this audience, which is um, what contact have you had with your governors and what have you been saying to your governing board? And then there's going to be dot 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 and has it made a difference? But do you would you like to start off first, Henny and, and Isaac? Um, we haven't yet, but we are planning to, and we have had an eco-governor with us for 10 years who has addressed our issues for us and like passed along anything we brought up to the board, and they've usually been successful in that endeavour. Um, I don't think I can really add to that. But... <laughs> Thank you. Um, what about at your school? Uh, well, the short answer is no, no. we haven't yet. Um, we've had students talk at the East Hampshire COP26, but no students, because we're a secondary school especially, and no students have talked to the governors. Yeah, it's going to be a no. It's going to be another no. <laughs> I think it's because, I th well, in my school, in my own experience, it was, there was a very clear divide, um, almost was reinforced between, even, to be honest, the head teacher and the rest of the senior leadership team. Um, but it was very difficult to kind of get past that. Um, and I still don't think that that's happened. So I think transparency and yeah. integration is definitely definitely needed in terms of sustainability. And that's really important for us to know. What, what about, have you got a different story? I do. Oh, oh. go on. Um, we brought in the governors quite a lot for our eco meetings and they brought in like uniform policy. We had a not very sustainable uniform, so we introduced a better one. And they also, you know, had to approve the the climate emergency as well as, and then um, we did a lot of uh, fundraising um, with their like help as well. So yeah, we did have some contact with the governors, and also my friend's mum is a governor, so I suppose. <laughs> so I, so I I regularly spoke to her. Um, her, num her number's on my phone, so yes. <laughs> Private conversations. And that's, and that's quite often how life works, isn't it? Through, through, <laughs> through contacts. But actually, there's a really serious point here, isn't there, which you brought up a moment ago, Eliza, about not, I think it was you, not, not um, necessarily having the ability to influence mm. the adults, whether those adults are, are, are teachers or, um, or, or the governing boards. And, I mean, this is a really difficult question, so you may may not be able to, to answer it, but what, what do you think schools could do differently in order to make that happen so that your voices really did make change? Now, it could just be, you know, us adults have to get our act together and listen. That could be the simple, simple answer. But if you've got, you know, any ideas about ways in which we as an organisation encouraging governing boards to take action on this. What, what are the sort of things we, we ought to be saying? Is that tough? Yeah, it's got a tough <laughs> question. Do you want to have a, why don't you all have a think about that? Because right. I actually want to bring um, Wendy Litherland is sitting in the, in the front um, of the hall and it's Wendy's pupils. You've got two more um, with you, haven't you, from Sir so, Christopher? So I think you're going to have a quick word with us about curriculum because we've mentioned curriculum very, very briefly. But um, uh, Wendy's a bit of um, uh, a hero in her region in that she's been very instrumental 
in setting up, as you mentioned a moment ago, Honey, the, the conference that's now, I believe, regional-wide, I'm sure you'll say a little bit, but the other reason I thought it was really important to let Wendy have the mic for a moment is that as a senior leader who has this agenda within her remit, that is one thing that very much that governing boards need to be doing. And I know this morning we just talked about how, how tight funding is. Um, so it's quite a difficult ask to be asking at the moment, but I just want to give Wendy the floor to talk about it a little bit from a senior leadership point of view. Yeah, okay, so indeed, she's got my indeed. Um, so my role is Director of Sustainability. It was a bit of a joke, to be quite honest, um, about 10 years ago. It was to keep me happy, to keep the eco team working as well. But it's paid my way to become an assistant head teacher at schools. So the main problem with it and with our schools, the fact we're so underfunded, that the eco group started making money. Um, we brought up over £200,000 into school through various things, from competitions um, to, to awards. Um, and all of a sudden, when you've got time to apply for your grants, the information is already there, but you're going to good practice is there. So I really do have to encourage you to ask the children personally. Sometimes it's even bypassing things like student council because they're all very um, led on curriculum and things like that. And get your business managers involved as well. Um, and also when you do empower a teacher, so obviously who has got to do this by 2025, make sure if it's not a senior leader, um, probably ideally not in many ways because they don't always have the time, but it's someone who's got the authority to make some decisions. Because when you're dealing with outside agencies, funding, children, children need the um, information back to them quickly. They don't remember three weeks ago you asked for this and you forgot about it, but six years later you can manage it. Um, they need it now, you know, we need the drinks changing, we need the uniform changing, we need all these things doing pretty much now. They need to see things in real time, otherwise it's going to be left. Ten years ago we started sorting the solar panels out, only now we're actually getting close to it. And that's not really funded, we can't go through different rooms, we can't even make it um, to do that. But we know now, Bobby will give you some of the figures in a minute, um, about how much we're actually going to save. Um, so when it comes to finances, this is going to save you money. Um, on many ways, it's going to empower our children to save it. And what we feel, where we are in the north of England, we're going to empower our children to save money for their families at home. So the poverty gap does not increase. Because the, we're talking, are we going to run a school? £25,000 are our electricity bill. That doesn't include heating this month. Right? And we're rather efficient. We've got a good mindset in the children switching lights off and things like that. But our catering, our kitchens are so out of date and the efficiencies in the ovens there. Um, so just to bear that in mind. So empower your children and make sure your staff have got the ability to make decisions. Brilliant. And do you want to hand the mic on, wasn't it, Bobby? You were going to say something about the Thanks. teaching and what you've been learning or indeed Great. anything else. Do introduce yourself. Hello, I am Bobby. I've been taught by Hanky for five years on sustainability. Yeah, it's, I think it's very important to learn about these things because as children need to know how to prevent climate change and like stop all these terrible things happening because we believe our environment is a very important thing for us because like helps our, because of, well it helps people's alive but it also helps with our social life like it can help us with our mental health because just well, going for a walk in was just quite an enjoyable experience. <coughs> Um, yeah, well, in our sixth form, we've introduced a heat ground pump, which is just something that will provide heat for everything. It saves us 40% on energy, which is quite a lot to do with, and it helps. <coughs> and we're, we're trying to introduce solar panels. We've just got um, from this website, we've got um, the point we've just about got it, and it will save us 55 tonnes in CO2 emissions from using normal electricity supplies and then in about 310 kilowatt hours of electricity. Yeah. So that's very, it should be yeah, at a time when energy costs are absolutely <coughs> spiralling. Yeah, yeah, indeed. Um, do you want to add, yeah, introduce, do you introduce yourself and say if you Hi, I'm Ari. I've also been taught by Wendy for five years, teaching me about sustainability and science lessons. Just one thing on funding, I know there's such a lack of it, but I think <coughs> senior school staff need to be aware that some of the changes you can make are really small, like at our school we do pre-loved uniform, so all ex-pupils return uniforms, so then other pupils can use them. 
which benefits sustainability but also help the financial situation which I know at this time can be quite difficult. I think there's also a need for environmental issues to be incorporated into the curriculum from primary school age to college even because there's a lack of it and I was lucky to learn about it but I think more need to. I think just one last thing. I think it's necessary for us to try and remove a bit of stigma about that people fighting for sustainability isn't just a pain or cost more money, but it also will be necessary in the future. Yeah, I think that's it. Thank you. <coughs> so, thank you so much. Um, so, I want to ask you all um, uh, what is the thing that you'd like? people in this room to go back to their schools and trusts and do. Um, and then I'll see whether there's um, time, I hope hopefully there'll be time for a couple of questions as well, which I'll start from this end now just <laughs> to even it up. What, what is your, your message that you must, you must do? Um, yeah, again, listen to the young people. We, we, we know what's going on and we're smarter than people give us credit for, I think. Um, we, we need empowered voices because if you kind of just hark on tradition, if you hark on the past and how it used to be, then you're never going to get anywhere with how, you know, things need to change, things can't stay the same. And I think that's what Teach the Future is trying to do is like, we can't keep having this like traditional curriculum that doesn't talk about climate change when you know we're in a climate emergency and we need to go towards net zero and you know the future needs to be prepared for it is there any part of the curriculum in particular that you think it doesn't do what it should do geography geography i mean like there's a debate on whether or not geography um whether or not climate change is good or bad which i just think is like very weird like it's, it is bad. I think it's agreed on that it's bad. I don't think we need to have like 15 year olds debating whether or not it's good or bad. So the, so the curriculum hasn't moved on? No. With, the, with like the, the recent science? Yeah, no, it hasn't. That's a, that is a bit shocking. <laughs> okay. Yeah, something that we talk about quite a lot in Mock Cop and again in Teach the Future is giving young people um, an adequate seat at the decision making table. Um, because quite often we talk about, well for me I talk about it quite often in the context of stuff like COP26 and COP27, young people are absolutely not given adequate space at the table to, to give their opinions, to contribute to the negotiating space and frankly that's not good enough because if we don't reflect those voices at the board level then the decisions that the board makes will not, will not benefit the, the people that, that are in the, the population, the young people. Um, but one way to do that is to have an easily accessible way for students to bring something to that table and then to listen to them and give them that opportunity and platform. Um, that could be, um, you know, having a governor at the sustainability meetings or having a suggestion box or letting some students have, there be a representative which sits on the governing board. But it's so important to make students feel like they have the opportunity to be listened to. Um, doesn't need to necessarily be everyone because there can be an appointed representative that feels confident enough to do that but if students know that they're being represented and that they have that opportunity to bring something to the highest level that they're able to then there's the opportunity for for change and i think wendy also mentioned this as well didn't you that you didn't do it through the traditional pupil council route and you're saying that as well are you that student because so many particularly secondary schools do have student councils but yeah. you're saying that doesn't necessarily do the job for these topics do you want to say a little bit um, more about yeah that? so i was on my i was chair of my school sustainability council and and even then we found it very difficult to pass on messages to the headmaster um and to the wider senior leadership team the only people that really had access to those was the prefects um and as a prefect for one year before I left school, um, it was very minimal time to be able to actually do anything. And even if you do sit on the student council, it's just kind of maybe the deputy head that you get to speak to and then the messages get passed on from there. And it's, 
you know, it's worked before, it's a traditional way of passing on messages in a school, but students have powerful voices and to kind of diminish them to have to be able to be passed on um, means that the power is, is lacking in, in, in their voices. Thank you. What about you, Liza? So I think I'm very lucky in that our head teacher really does listen to our student voices. But um, I think, you know, what we were saying with the governing boards, almost none of, no people on this panel have been talking to the, mm. them. So I think that is what we need to put pressure on. And so this is in a slightly special situation because you have got a, a member of your senior leadership team with this of responsibility and you probably don't necessarily realise that that's still quite unusual. In fact, we could do, um, we could do ask people, can you put your hands up if you've got someone on your senior leadership team who has an environmental sustainability lead role? How many others? So we've got a couple. We've got a couple. Well, literally a couple, I think, haven't we? It's quite hard to see. So do you see what I mean? That you are in a bit of a privileged situation. And actually, I probably should do, again, make stand up and take a bow. Because, no, she's given no, she just made She just made a face at me. Because I hope that you know our guidance that we produce for governing boards has, has a lot of these um, ideas in and basically that guidance wouldn't have happened. It's all very well for me to front these sorts of events but if you don't have somebody who's going away and doing the work as Meg has has been doing. So boards now have, I would say this wouldn't I, our lovely guidance. So if you all through your networks can then also be pushing that from your end, hopefully we can do a, a bit of a, a pincer movement. Um, but Yes, yeah, so I just thought I ought to tell you, you may think that this is going on in every school across the land and I can tell you that's why we invited you and Wendy here because it absolutely isn't. But, but talk to us about what you would like governing boards more generally to do. I think besides the clear sort of like listen to the students, they sometimes have decent things to say. You, you know, teenagers are like... Um, <laughs> I think that maybe like extend a hand to them because you're like you're scary. It's like this like Stephen King monster in the background. We don't know because it's like the head teacher's scary and you're the head teacher's boss. So, yeah. So I think if there's a hand out, even if that hand is not taken, there's. I guess some like humanization, like you, like, so like you want, like you want to help, and you're like giving us an opportunity, so we'll be more like receptive to talk and give give you our ideas as you've like you've asked for them, rather than we feel like you're we're like throwing them at you over some fence. <laughs> you know. Thank you. And um, Isaac, would you like to add to that? What, what would you like these people to go home and do? Um, I think that we need to not only educate the governing boards, but also staff within schools themselves to be more sustainable and have an environmental conscience and just um, to educate on that to their pupils and to put in place things that we can do and maybe focus funding onto aspects of environmental issues rather than other things. Thank you. So I think we have, we have got um, a little bit of time for, for questions. If anybody wants to, um, or as Mark said, reflect as well as as well as ask the question. Is there are there any any? Oh, a, there will be. Oh yeah, Meg, if you you lend your mic, that would be good. Thank you. Yes, but you do have to speak. Okay. <laughs> Right, thank you first of all very much indeed. Really, really interesting. Um, before lunch, we had a speaker who was telling us that um, many, many students are really concerned about the future. So I thought it'd be an opportunity to ask yourselves how concerned you are for the future, maybe on a scale of one to 10. And we hear about sustainability on a macro level, all the big sort of stuff we can do, and also on a micro level, how it affects our day-to-day -day living. Um, I wondered, in the context of it, if you do have concerns for the future, what is the biggest concern that most concerns you? The biggest concern that 
or issue that most concerns you. Thank you. Thank you. And we will have a, have a think, because I think you were all, yeah, do you want to do another question while we've got the mic there? Thank you. Hi, I'm uh, Tony Breslin, and in a previous life, I led a charity that's now called Young Citizens, a lot of work on student voice. And we did a project about 15 years ago, which put young people such as yourselves onto, onto the governing bodies as associate members of 13 schools. I've just looked up the report while <laughs> you were speaking. And not one, when the project ended after its two years, not one of those schools stood down those associate members. Mm -hmm. And there's something about that when schools have the courage, and really this is, I suppose, to my colleagues here, because you're the demonstration of it. When schools have the courage to increase and broaden student voice, and I don't just mean the usual suspects on the school council, um, and that's not a dig at anybody, but <laughs> when they have the courage to deepen student voice, to involve students in recruitment, to involve students in surveys, to have presentations to the leadership team and the governing board. They very rarely roll it back. So they're very worried to go there, but it's so full of discovery, and you're an illustration of that. And, and really, it's kind of to say to my, my colleagues as governors, you know, there's nothing to fear in this. There might be some challenges, but there's nothing to fear. And, and if we don't, what other business wouldn't listen to its customers, wouldn't listen to its clients, etc. You know, pe big businesses spend a fortune on market research. You know, actually, if we just enabled uh, our young people in schools to have a bit more voice, occasionally give them a budget, give them a platform, you're a demonstration of what can be achieved, not just in the environmental environment. So just a just a shout out for that, Mark. So there you go. Some support <laughs> for increasing, increasing people's voice. And I'm sure Tony isn't the only person in the audience. But do you want to answer Matt's question? What, what are your biggest, well, sing, single concern? And is it the macro issues or the, the micro ones? Definitely micro issues. Um, I'm very concerned about climate refugees and uh, especially their like classification within like the UN Refugee Convention. Um, they're not classed as refugees, they're classed as Im economic migrants and pushing forward like, you know, the rights of refugees towards people who have to flee their countries because of the effects of climate change. So that's my biggest concern. Wow, that is a, that is a huge, huge issue and incredibly uh, important at the moment, possibly just beyond the influence of governing boards, but still... Yeah, sorry. Really, really <laughs> you, you mentioned because I don't think we've yet... Have we used the phrase climate, climate justice, which is a big part of the debate, yeah. isn't it? What about you? Yeah, I'm also going to talk about climate justice, but in a different kind of setting. Um, my concern, again, macro issues to do with climate change, but getting um, representation in like bodies as big as the UN from places like the Global South where activists and campaigners find it very, very, very difficult to get their voices heard beyond the boundaries of their community for lack of funding. It's, it, it's something like £7,000 to be able to go to um, COP27 this year and, it, and the prices got hiked up in Egypt, which is ridiculous. But to get there, People don't have that kind of money. People in the Global South, poorer communities, the ones that are on the front lines, don't have that kind of money to go to these big conferences and get their voices heard. Um, and even then, they'll go as observers and they won't be able to access the places where the negotiations really happen. So, again, maybe a bit outside the, <laughs> the remit of the governors, but something that I am working on at the moment. Yeah, really, really important. Eliza. Um, I'd say definitely the macro um, side of it because, you know, adults will ask you, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I know me and a lot of young people just think, do we actually have that future? Um, obviously, this is very much outside of school, school <laughs> sustainability, but I'd say that's my biggest concern. Yeah. yeah so the, the real big impact exactly, of exactly. what's happening across, mm -hmm. across the globe. Honey. I mean, of course, um, the macro issues are a genuine concern. But I think on a, on a school level, 
if like there's, there's a school push and like a, an awareness in the school of what we do for sustainability, or even it's just like recycling or like there's no single no single use plastic, we like reuse and a lot like um, peel of uniforms. There's there's kind of a like you can there's a slight relaxation as you feel like you're doing something, however small it is, which is nice. And um, to add to um, Tony's point, she said, I believe that um, students will speak to the level of their environment. So if you can elevate them to a higher environment, then they will genuinely express their ideas for that. But if you like keep them down for want of a better phrase, then you won't hear that, what they have to say, and it won't be articulated as well. Thank you. And what about you, Isaac, your um, big concern? I think that we need to be able to use more renewable energy sources, but at the moment it's not currently possible for a lot of schools because of the cost of that. Um, but it would help a lot for our environment in the long term and um, to be able to like, live for longer and keep our earth. Absolutely. In fact, NGA wrote to the Secretary of State, probably now about five Secretary of State to go, although it wasn't that long ago, particularly around the issue on funding for environmental um, uh, issues and particularly around buildings and premises because they're the ones often, aren't they, with the big um, price tag. Um, uh, it's highly, highly unlikely we're going to get any more, but they are trying to work with the business department to ring fence. So the um, business department base has um, a pot of money that you can apply to um, uh, to improve um, environmental um, aspects of buildings. And currently, there isn't a particular pot from schools, but they may be fence ring fencing some for schools. Um, so as soon as they do that, you will absolutely um, hear about it. But there's what there was, I saw Rani waving at me. Yes, so shall we have one more um, question? And then I was like, oh, and go on then, Meg, if you've got a, uh, let's do two, two at a time, and then we'll bring the, question, the session to a close. Thank okay. you. Okay, my question is quite simple, actually, and I think Isaac has already can't wait, addressed it. How do I raise £50,000 for... Uh, solar panels for both of the schools that I'm a governor at. How do you get the money? Somebody said they'd fundraise the money. Was it you guys? It was, it was me. You. Go yes. on, talk about how you got money. How did you manage to find some money? Um, well, the main thing was actually non-uniform days. Because if you have a school of 2,000 kids and they're each paying two pounds, you've already got quite a large portion of your money. Um, I think some of it came also of the school budget and then just like small student fundraising activities, bake sales, things like that. Wow, that's quite an impressive mm. way to have accumulated all the money. Did you, want to, yeah. did you want to add to that? Was it Isaac? Did you want um, to add to that? In our like eco group and when we went to our sustainability learning conference, we held like a stall where we sold like things that we made personally and I made stickers and people make like other things and we sold them and raised money for our school. And then we also do a lot of things and we plan events to do in our eco club to raise money for um, our interests. And it's all self-funded. Thank you. Do you want to wave your leaflet around? Because I think you've brought one, haven't you, for the work that you're doing up in the Northwest. So if there are people in the Northwest here, make a beeline for this. But I think, Wendy, you are now saying other folk are welcome to attend too. Do you want do I um, and then well why don't do you want to say say ask your question and then and then we'll finish with Wendy's plug yeah quick question uh, well firstly uh, I, I've been this is inspirational fabulous stuff you've been saying and I've been writing furiously lots of notes for those schools who are just starting out on their journeys what would be your one recommendation of something really really simple that they could do to make a success to get the whole ball rolling so a first step, a tiny step that might set us off to the whole big school strategy. Our first step was like talking with both the business manager and the headmaster. Um, we like forced him to come into Eco Club and we all gave speeches to him. And the business manager was quite supportive, so he's able to like help with grants, help with funding, um, and where to put money. And I think having 
like people who like the headmaster and a business manager who can guide you on like the money side of things and the more um, administrative side of things is really beneficial like get their support if you can Thank you. I'd say if you haven't set up like a student teacher governor group definitely do that um, and then you can bounce off ideas with each other um, and start asking the questions where is my food coming from where's our energy coming from where's the food waste going to um, are we turning all the lights off just ask the basic questions and honestly you'll find that it really snowballs from there thank you one tiny first step for people who haven't started um, I think starting with the committee, similar to what they were saying, so uh, a, an area for students to be able to talk to the teachers and make positive changes in the school, it just as a first step, really. Mm -hmm. I think maybe just like a really small project that even could perhaps be teacher before it's handed off to the students, such as like, and like a push for like water bottles for the water fountains, as you know, like saying that, oh, once a, uh, I don't know, like at least twice a week, then do it every day. Just have these like students saying, oh, well, like check like a water bottle, and if you do, you'll get, I know, like a sticker, like whatever, whatever. Fifteen Ross will tell you they love stickers. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, I think just like a really a really small project that can seem to do a lot, especially if it's school wide. You, you know, some something like that. Isaac, you get the last word. Um, I think that students that are passionate about the environment should be able to voice their opinions to the rest of the school. And like the word from students really like helps others to really take that opinion because it's not from a teacher and you like, you know the person that's telling you this and you might have a better trust for them rather than somebody who's in command of you somebody who's on the same level and who you might know in your year group to talk to you. Thank you. And, oh, did you want, did you want to have a very quick word as well? Go on, have you got a, you got a takeaway? Uh, I think the most important thing is, like, get the people involved in the climate change issue because, like, we need to be able to actively do something, see what's happening, just like planting seeds or something simple like that, just, like, see how you can grow your own food in case of food shortages do like crops not being able to grow anymore but like yeah so just because just doing something is about <coughs> 10 times better than just listening it because it might be go through one side you're and out the other thank you just before i thank the panel wendy did you just want to say about your your um leaflet well, yeah just remember make it fun for children um get local groups involved if they've got lots of things you can help you with empower your ETA as well that's really Thank you so much, and I would also give another plug for our guidance, which does, if I say so myself, have some really good starting points and some really good questions. And, and Mel, it's so lovely to know that that you've been you've been using it too. We tried to make it as incredibly friendly and practical as we as we possibly could. Um, the panels uh, work for days and quite over because we've taught them into doing a little bit of filming for our e-learning module for, for 2020. <laughs> 
three, but before they leave um, to do that, I really appreciate uh, a thank you for our tremendous panel. Thank you, thank you so much, um, everybody. So we will let, and I realise I haven't got my clicker, I've obviously abandoned it somewhere. So it was now going to display the Greener Governance Pledge behind me. So if you haven't done that, I hope that today's inspired you to um, go away and meet with your students and come up with some, some actions. So thank you, everybody. Thank you so much for thank being you. with us.